Warren um, Kovach is um, a Bella Heritage trustee. Uh, he also runs his own computing business based here on the island. And when he has his spare time, he is uh, very keen on local history and has published several books and runs a blog spot, which you might mention, but it's called I Will See History. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Um, he has travelled extensively, and uh, particularly on the island, and is a wonderful photographer. Um, I think that's probably an adequate introduction. But we're delighted to welcome Warren to talk to us about the historic buildings of Anglesey. Thank you very much, Joanna. And um, I'd like to first start off saying, as you will rapidly becoming aware by my accent, I'm not a native of Anglesey. I've been in um, Britain since about 1987, though. I'm originally from Ohio in the United States and came over to work at universities and um, lived in Aberdeen for a while and then moved to so, Aberyst with and then moved to Anglesey back in 1992. And as I usually do when I'm traveling around and living in different places, I always start exploring the history of that place soon, you know, when I get there just to find out about the past, about the people, and you know, just basically trying to find out more about what I'm, where I'm living. And since I've been in Anglesey for quite a long time now, I've had a chance to learn quite a lot about the, the history of, of Anglesey. So um, when I first uh, started, to, uh, when I first moved up here, as Joanna said, I uh, set up my own software company and I'm developing software. And at the time, the early 90s, the internet and the World Wide Web was just beginning to become popular and a thing. And so I had set up a web page uh, promoting my business to sell my software. <laughs> And I also decided I would put a page on there about the history of Anglesey, just a brief, you know, six or seven paragraph page or whatever. And that sort of developed uh, through the years. I added another bit about the, uh, about the Menai Strait bridges. I added a bit about the natural history of the island. And as I went on through the years, I started adding more and more things about other different places, topics like about old maps <coughs> of the island. Um, so I've got so sections all about... Uh, um, the churches on Anglesey and about different types of prehistoric monuments on Anglesey, a big section about windmills, but this website has grown and grown and grown and now it's, it's, called, it's become quite popular now. When you search for Anglesey history, it's usually the first or second uh, listing that comes up on Google, so it's, it's been around a long time and has developed um, quite a lot over the years. I'm still developing and anytime I go visit a new church and take some pictures, I'll add it onto it and with a little bit about what I could find out about that church. Um, and as a result of having this on the internet, I was approached by a publisher many years ago called Amberley Publishing, and they asked me to do a book about Anglesey history for a new, they're a fairly new local history uh, publisher, and they asked me to do a book uh, for their series. They had this through time series from different places, so you have like uh, Manchester through time, Glasgow through time, and they asked me to do an Anglesey through time book, which I, uh, which I did, and that was published back in uh, 2013. And um, what I'm basically going to do first is I'd like to go take you through um, a bit about, uh, 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 to show you a few examples of, of what I've done with that book anyways, and show you some of the historic houses and, and other buildings that, uh, that I've discussed in the book. The format of the uh, Through Time series is basically uh, where you have an old photograph combined with a new photograph to show how it's changed through time. Um, and usually you have either sometimes old engravings or paintings, but mostly you'd have photographs from old postcards from the turn of the century, turn of the 20th century in those days. And then, uh, then I would go off to try to find a similar spot, you know, the same viewpoint to see how it's changed today. As I'll show you a bit later on, sometimes it's uh, proved to be a bit challenging trying to find the exact same spot or even the same buildings anymore. You know, some of them have completely disappeared. But what I did uh, basically doing this is I uh, went, uh, went to the Anglesey archives and went through their extensive collection of photographs and found some of the most interesting ones, the most uh, photogenic ones to, to use in the book and then went out to try to find uh, the, uh, the uh, spots where they were done, uh, where those original uh, photographs were taken. I'll just go through a few, uh, few examples of showing you uh, some of the places here. And I'm, gonna, I'm focusing a bit on things near the sea since this is supposed to be you know, a lot of the talks we're doing here are about the sea. So basically here you see Menai Bridge Town taken from the suspension bridge. And this was um, sometime before 1913. Um, 
when soon after the uh, suspension bridge was built, there was very little around uh, uh, Menai Bridge at all. There was just a, a few scattered cottages on the shorelines there for Portaithway, which it was called then. And then you also had what was the old ferry house, which is now the Cambria Inn on Cambria Road, which is one of the oldest houses in um, Menai Bridge. And that would have serviced the ferries that came across from Bangor and landed, landed here. So, but as the bridge was uh, built, um, as more people came in to, uh, uh, to help construct the building, and then uh, the town of Menai Bridge started growing. So you can see through the time, through the different um, pictures, how it's developed. So you can see here back in 1913, this is all still pretty open to open spaces. They had just, at that point, started building the embankments here, and the roads, extending the beach road and all that. Uh, but you still see some of the old, you can still see the Cambry in there, which is, uh, where is it at? It's there, I guess. And uh, this old warehouse, it's, uh, that's in these buildings here. But you can see that it's filled in quite a lot more down here with, uh, with buildings and, and uh, having been built. The, uh, another example to show you how much things have changed is uh, Church Island, St. Cecilia's. Uh, this is a picture from 1904. And you can see there's much more uh, vegetation around uh, the island. First, to give you the, the history of it, uh, St. Cecilia's, of course, was, uh, the church was founded on this island by St. Cecilia around 630 AD. And the church building that stands there now, even though it says above the door, founded in 630 AD, that building wasn't actually built in 630 AD. The original buildings uh, for the monastery there would have been uh, wooden uh, buildings or whatever. So the building that's there now, the church that's there now, was first built around the 15th century. So it dates from that. But you can see on Church Island, they built this, I'm not sure when the causeway was built actually, but it was a late 19th century that was a, uh, this causeway was uh, developed along here. And you can see there was very little vegetation on the island compared to what there is now. Half of the island was actually fenced off. The cemetery and the church was just on, on that side. The other side was actually a working farm. There's a farmhouse there. So it eventually expanded later on in the early 20th century, but at this time in 1904, that was still a, uh, a working farm on half of it. And you can see a lot of the trees are built up. But you can see this tree that are, that's here that everybody thinks is some old ancient yew, hundreds of years old or whatever. It's not. It's a Monterey cypress for one thing, rather than a yew. And you can see the little shrub there in 1904 that's turned into that tree here now. So it's fairly, it's much faster growing than a yew, but it's still a magnificent tree. A few more from by the sea from around the island. Um, Amlock Harbor, uh, this is a picture of it in 1915. Uh, um, in the early 18th century, there was just a little harbor there between two, um, uh, uh, between two rocky cliffs, basically. But there wasn't much going on uh, uh, at, uh, in there at all until the uh, rich seam of um, copper was discovered in Paris Mountain in 1768. So at that point, when that, uh, this port being the nearest point to Paris Mountain, this became developed for the, the, the port where the copper would be exported from Paris Mountain. The, uh, so the harbor really started being transformed at that point, a lot more ships coming in, a lot more buildings being built and the like. The harbor was approved in 1793, which allowed it at that time to accommodate up to 30 ships all through the, the channel uh, and, uh, and the, the, uh, the pier out on, on the end there. The activity by, on the port declined in the second half of the 19th century as the copper finds declined, uh, not, not much of what was going on through there. Although there was still some uh, good bit of shipbuilding that was being done here at the time, so a lot of uh, sailing ships were still being built in Amalek. Uh, but then in the 1970s and 80s, the port was revived again because it was being used for ships that were going out to Shell's offshore oil terminal uh, at the time. And then since that's closed, then the, uh, it's mainly just pleasure craft that are using that. And uh, uh, one of the pilot ships for Liverpool, I think, uses that quite regularly and, and the um, uh, lifeboats as well. But you can see now the uh, pleasure crafts down here rather than the tall masted sailing ships. And of course, a lot of the old warehouses have disappeared, although some of them have been repurposed into the, the museums and the sail loft that are down there now. So it's a, the uh, life on the pier is beginning to build up, uh, pick up again because of, of those uh, features down there. Another uh, seaside place on Anglesey is uh, South Stack Lighthouse. This, was, this, this picture is from uh, 1908. Um, 
The uh, lighthouse tower itself was built around 1808, uh, but the surrounding buildings uh, here just came and went as the, the needs for the, uh, the lighthouse keepers uh, changed uh, through the years. The most noticeable difference you can see between these two pictures, not much difference between the lighthouse there and of course the rock, but uh, you can see there's this large two-story building there, which is now gone from down here. That was, um, it was built in 1886 to house the uh, telegraph station officers. Um, but that fell into disrepair, and um, uh, when all the staff uh, on the, on the uh, lighthouse were evacuated to go off to fight in World War I, the, that building eventually was so dilapidated that it was demolished in the, uh, 1923. But this small building that's there, which is a small outbuilding, which was behind there, that's still standing there. Um, not as easy to see in this, but the, uh, the main um, building of, uh, attached to the lighthouse there was um, re-roofed about 1937 and 38. And they've also had the old fog, new foghorn has been built here, and the old fog signal and the telegraph outlook uh, buildings that were over, over here have now been replaced by this new horn and, um, uh, and the fog, new fog signal. There's a couple other ones. We'll move inland now, and this is a uh, picture from Badadern on the <coughs> London Road. This is a picture taken about uh, uh, 1900. This is the main London Road running through the village, and I like this picture because uh, we've got this old chapel here, and the school is on the other side of the road, so all the school children are out here probably getting the picture taken in the middle of the road, which you would probably want to do today with health and safety and all that. But, um, but they've, uh, we've got the, uh, the chapel there. And that's the uh, Gilgal Calvinist Methodist Chapel. That was first built in 1806. And it was rebuilt and enlarged several times as many of the chapels on Anglesey and throughout Wales really were. They would start with a small, simple building and try to and rebuild it and extend it to accommodate the growing, uh, growing uh, congregations. The, um, this photo here shows it just before the most recent remodeling of it, which was in 1911. Um, so I found this, up, as I say, I like this photo with all the school children out there proudly posing and all that. So I got this photo uh, from the um, Anglesey archives and they went off one sunny day to go photograph it. Walked around the corner and what did I find but scaffolding and the door. The, the chapel had been demolished two days before I arrived to photograph it. <laughs> so... <laughs> I decided to put it any anyways, because that tells you the story about these buildings come and go. They change, they get repurposed, new buildings get built in places of old ones. I haven't been back since, I'm not sure what's been built there, whether anything has, but it was just the, the, you know, just the sad you know, arch of the doorway left with all this uh, the scaffolding and the rubble around it. <coughs> now the other one, this other side, uh, tells a bit better story actually, which has developed since uh, I first published the book. This is uh, the post office at Tinagongo. Uh, this is a, a picture in 1909. And it was the old post office and shop. It would have been the, the mainstay. It would have been the, the center <laughs> of, the, of the parish, doing uh, everything, selling all sorts of goods. And it was a, a, quite an extensive shop. That was um, uh, throughout the 19th century and early 20th century. It was run by John Pritherick Williams for more than 40 years. He was uh, the main person. And then from 1902, it was his son, William, ran it. They sold groceries, draperies, general goods, as all these shops um, around the island did at the time. The post office moved to the center of Benclec around in, later in the 20th century. Uh, so the post office moved out of here, and the grocery shop eventually closed. And when I was um, doing uh, the book then, the, the building was abandoned, all boarded up, looking in a quite sad state. And in my research, I found that uh, at the time, there's planning permission in to have to demolish this building and build three new, three or four new houses um, on that corner there. But uh, just within the past few months there, I've been driving by and I've seen that uh, the, the work had started on this, rebuilding this again, and now it's been turned to uh, several, uh, three or four lovely new houses now. So that building has been saved. Uh, so it looks in a much better state than what this is. So um, <laughs> that, that's a, a good story rather than something being demolished and something, you know, uh, new horrible house being built in this place. <coughs> and this is another one of my favorite pictures from the book too. You don't often see uh, elephants and camels going down the Clan Kebby High School. 
this was sometime in the early 20th century, and uh, uh, the circus obviously was coming to town, so they had uh, all the riders on the camels and pulling a wagon that had a brass band on it, and then gaggles of children coming along behind it, waiting, you know, uh, waiting for the, uh, the circus to start. This, was, this photo was taken by Maurice Price, who was a stationer and bookseller in, and a professional photographer in uh, Clam Gevney. And it was taken from outside his shop, which is right on the main <laughs> high street, right around, um, across from the old foundry of uh, the pub. It was one, one of the shops there. I think it was probably the old guest's bookshop, uh, the stationer's, uh, but I'm not quite sure exactly which building it was his. But um, anyways, but he, he uh, uh, there's a <clears throat> great collection of his photographs in the Anglesey archives. Uh, all plate glass photographs from his large format camera and all that. Of, he was always out on the street taking pictures of what was going on at the cattle markets and, and it was just life of people being around the town. Did a lot of portrait photography too and then occasionally did a bit of traveling further afield and, and took photographs. But he's had a, a fantastic collection that documents the, uh, uh, the town and the Anglesey at the, uh, you know, around that time in the early 20th century. And of course, uh, as I say, you don't see any camels or um, uh, mm -hmm. elephants on the streets in Clan Gedney anymore, just lots of cars. And then this is uh, Capel Kildoran in Clan Gedney, or just on the outskirts of Clan Gedney. And um, this was a picture from 1920, I think that is. Um, 1910, that is, yeah. Um, and this, there's an interesting story behind this, which I'll go into a little bit more later. Uh, <coughs> but it's renowned uh, for um, being the, the home uh, church of Christmas Evans, who was a very renowned preacher in the, uh, um, in the uh, late uh, 18th, early 19th century. And it was also the first Baptist chapel that was built on Anglesey. The um, chapel was first built in 1791, um, and it was rebuilt in 1878, and fell into disuse uh, until after the new chapel Penuel down further in the center of uh, Clan Avenue was built in 1880, 1897. It was reopened, though, in the 1980s as an evangelical chapel, which is still being used as today. The building itself hasn't changed much. Uh, it's recently had a whitewash, so it looks a bit brighter. But you can see that the building is still pretty much the same uh, as it was when this picture was taken. As I'll show you later, there have been some changes. But, um, but of course, the streets have been widened again. It's a much busier street there now than when you could stand there and have your picture taken with an old, slow camera. So that gives you a few, an idea of what the uh, of uh, the types of things that are in, in the uh, Anglesey through time book. Basically, trying to to uh, show you uh, you know how things have changed and to show you what things uh, used to look like. And then um, after publishing that, that sold fairly well, and the publishers came back to me and asked me to do a book then for their next uh, new series they have, which is a fifty buildings series. And again, that's things like Glasgow and fifty buildings, or Manchester and fifty buildings, or whatever. And that book is. Um, uh, basically, it has fewer pictures but more text, so you can actually go in to develop the history of the buildings more. And you're not restricted to actually having to show old buildings, old uh, pictures uh, versus the new ones. So I'll go through and uh, show you, uh, um, talk about a few of the buildings that are in that book, plus a few other ones that aren't in the book but are quite interesting. So first off, I'll start with. Oops, wrong way. First off, I'll start with uh, Manor Heritage Zone Prince's Pier. This is the old warehouse down on the, uh, the waterfront, which um, uh, is owned by Mentormon and is bought by Mentormon a little while ago, and we are in partnership with them to develop this. Um, to tell you uh, a little bit more about its history, um, as I said, showing you that first picture about the, of, of Menai Bridge from the bridge, um, before the bridge was built, there was just a few scattered houses and the ferry house. But um, during the construction and after the bridge was opened in 1826, the town grew. And Richard Davies, who was a, a, a businessman from Clan Gedney, saw opportunities there as the town was growing. And so he leased a good bit of land on the waterfront there, uh, including you know, between the two landing stages uh, on, on either side there, and also on Water Street, and started building warehouses for, uh, for storing goods that are being shipped in through the port. Uh, in 18, uh, at least the, the land in 1828, and then he built the uh, uh, warehouses that are along Water Street. And then later on, as this uh, pier uh, or as this wharf was built, then he uh, built this uh, warehouse on on the waterfront, probably in the late 1840s or early 1850s. And you've got a large warehouse there, and the pier master's house then was that end part. Um, uh, right there, where the, the man who was in charge of uh, all the activities on the pier lived. 
the Davies family basically used the, uh, this warehouse and the wharf for shipping slates out to around the world and also importing timber, mainly for, starting from Quebec. They also we would have a lot of uh, passengers who were ex um, emigrating to the New World would leave from there too. They, they first were uh, 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 purchased their own ship. After they had run it for a while, they decided they were going to expand the business. Purchased, they purchased their own ship called the Chieftain in 1843. And then as their business grew, they uh, built or purchased 11 more ships. So it was quite an extensive uh, shipping operation that was being run out of here by the Davies family. They eventually expanded and had other ports and, and other ships that are elsewhere, but this was the, the heart of it. The, um, in um, 1870, uh, or was 1873, they built an iron pier um, out from the wharf there to accommodate passenger ships as the uh, as you started getting passenger ferries and, and tourist uh, ferries coming in to the Menai Bridge. There, there used to be an old stone pier where St. George's Pier, the other pier, is now and that started becoming dilapidated so they built this iron uh, uh, bridge there then for the, uh, to accommodate these ships until St. George's Pier was rebuilt later. And you can see now, the, uh, as I said, Mentremont bought this, uh, has bought it with, in conjunction with Menai Heritage. And back in 2014, the whole inside of it was, um, was uh, refurbished. The, the, um, all the ivy was taken off the outside and uh, walls rebuilt and all that, and new ceiling put on and all that. So it's a fantastic space there now. <coughs> and Menai Heritage, over the years, uh, past few years now, have been planning on wanting to turn uh, Princess Pier into a, a heritage center and a place for exhibiting our collections. We currently have our exhibition here, um, but given that this is a community hall, which is used for a lot of other activities, uh, we, it's, it puts restrictions on what we can do. So we now have been uh, working very hard putting funding in for various, from various organizations, and we're sort of waiting on those now. But we're right at the stage now where we're hoping we'll be able to get funding to be able to turn this space into an exhibition space for our collections, as well as building a, a, a glass enclosed uh, cafe and restaurant on the, on the front of it. So, um, we, as I say, we're waiting for the funding and watch this space. If you're interested in finding out more about it, you can talk to any of the trustees or we've got some boards on back there on, on display showing what some of the plans, suggested plans are for developing this space here anyways. And if you want to learn more about the history of Prince's Pier, we've just recently published a book written by one of our trustees, a former trustee, uh, Julie Stone, uh, The Piers and Pier Masses in Menai Bridge, which talks a lot about the history of the piers and most, more importantly, talks about the people who worked there, the people who visited there and played there and all that. We've got copies of the book for sale on the, on the back table if you're interested in finding out more about that. Now I'll take you on to another uh, uh, more familiar building, uh, familiar to you know, uh, people on, on Anglesey, of course, Beaumaris Castle in, in Beaumaris. The, uh, of course, it was built by Edward I. Uh, work was started in 1295. Uh, basically, after he conquered uh, Wales, he built a series of castles all through North Wales to subdue the, the native Welsh. Beaumaris Castle was the last one to, to start after Carnarvon and Conway and, and all the others. Uh, work started in 1295. The work was overseen by Master James of St. George, who was his favorite architect uh, in, in building his uh, defensive structures. The progress on building Beaumaris Castle slowed after just about two years as the debt mounted and Edward started being more interested in fighting the, the Scots rather than uh, uh, looking towards Wales anymore. And eventually the uh, uh, construction on it stopped in 1300, so the, the castle was never really finished. The walls were never built to their highest level, and, um, and the buildings that were in the center were never um, uh, developed as they had planned. It was um, held by Owen Glendur's uh, forces during uh, his revolt for a couple of years, and then retaken by the Royalist forces in, um, in 1405. And then during the Civil War, the English Civil War was refortified again in 1642 and it was occupied by both the Royalists and the Parliamentarians due to, during the time. The, it was bought by uh, the Bulkley family, by Thomas Bulkley, in 1807 for the grand sum of 735 pounds. And, um, and they developed it uh, basically as almost like a, their own Victorian folly. And you can see here a very romantic uh, view of it. Um, 
uh, with the flowers and people in Edwardian dress so visiting outside. And you can also see how they use the castle. They've got tennis court in the middle here, so that was their little private uh, tennis courts in, in, within the castle. They, in 1925, the Bokeby family gifted it to the state, to the Ministry of Works, which is now Cadu, and um, then they restored it, took all the ivy off, restored all the stonework and all that, and of course it's now one of the most uh, popular and, and well-known tourist attractions on the island. Now if we go further along the coast from, um, uh, from Bomaris, uh, along to, to Clan Badrick near uh, Camice, and we come to one of my favorite uh, uh, little, uh, of numerous little stone churches on Anglesey, and that's Clan Badrick. This was uh, founded in 440 AD. The, it was um, uh, supposedly founded by St. Patrick, the, uh, the Irish patron saint. He apparently was sailing across the north of Anglesey, but he got shipwrecked on the island out there. He managed to get to shore and found a cave just below the, the cliffs here where he was able to shelter, and there was a well nearby that he was able to get clean water from. So uh, after... Uh, Having survived his shipwreck and found a safe haven, he decided to uh, build a church here. And it's now named after him, Clan Badrick. This uh, stone building was uh, first built in the early 14th century, which makes it one of the oldest of the stone, uh, old stone churches on Anglesey. It was probably extended around the 16th century because the chancel is longer than you'll find in most of these uh, similar types of, of medieval stone churches. You can see it's a, it extends quite a long way back compared to what many others would only come to about uh, that uh, there or so. And then it was, um, uh, other rest restoration was done. The porch was added in, in 1840. There was a major reconstruction that was done in 1884, and that was fun funded by um, Her Henry Stanley, the third baron of Alderley, uh, who owned the Penrose estate near, um, near uh, Hollyhead. And uh, Stanley was a Muslim convert, and he was the first uh, Muslim MP. And so he used, uh, uh, in construction of the church, and he uh, basically uh, decided instead of using the normal pictorial types of stained glass, the stained glass you'll find in the church are all sorts of decorative, geometric, uh, and naturalistic patterns uh, that you would see in the Islamic world rather than what you'd normally find in the, in the, the Christian world. So it's a very, a very interesting uh, church from that point, very beautiful windows in there. And, and some of the tile work to work on the back behind the altar, though, is, is similar. He was also involved in the restoration of St. Peter's Church in Newborough, and that also will have similar Islamic designs in the, uh, in the windows. In the 1880s, it was restored again to uh, uh, um, to fix it up, and um, 15,000 pounds were, were raised to, to fund the work, and it was finished in 1985. But unfortunately, just a few weeks later, um, shortly after that, arsonist struck and set a serious fire in the church, and it was very badly damaged. They had to go around, and, and, um, and particularly the roof was very badly damaged by the, um, by the, uh, the fire. But the money was raised again, and now it's um, been uh, fixed up again, and it was reopened in 1987. And it's a fantastic place to visit. Um, there's usually a, a rota of volunteers who are there to allow you to look around the church and tell you anything you want to know. Also, very uh, knowledgeable volunteers are usually there. And it's also a wonderful, peaceful place to, uh, to look out over the sea. During the nesting period, you can hear all the gannets out on the island there and um, just feel the breeze in your hair. It's a very evocative place. As a matter of fact, the story goes that the uh, Dalai Lama uh, the Tibetan um, uh, uh, Buddhist leader uh, uh, visited here once, and he announced that uh, Clan Bad he was sitting up on a bench above the uh, above the church there, and he said, "This is the most peaceful place in the world." So, if you haven't been there yet, it's well worth a, uh, a visit to see Clan Badrick. And to move on to some uh, domestic architecture, there's a lot of uh, very old houses in, around Anglesey, built through built various times through the ages, but most of them have been refurbished and rebuilt and uh, changed purpose and all that. So you really don't get much of a feeling of, of, their old, of the old history. But this particular house, Havati, near Clan Saturn, is, a, is an exception. This is one of the oldest house, houses in Anglesey, and it survived, survives in this pristine condition, basically, because it was, uh, had very little signs of, of modernization within it. It was probably built in the middle of the 15th century, and it was owned by Thomas Norris in uh, 1456. He was originally from West Derby in, uh, in, uh, in Lancashire, and he was part of the English establishment that was settled in Bomaris around the castle. 
uh, it was passed on through his family until about 1511, and then it transferred to the Bulkley family again, uh, who still own the Freda for, for the house and for the lands around there today. It was originally called Bud Arthur, after, but after its transfer to the Bulkleys, it became known as Havati, which of course means summer house. And basically, it was used as a, a house for some of the tenant farmers uh, until the 1970s, when it was passed on again to the Ministry of Works and now Cadu, who restored it. And when you go in, you can see the uh, great examples of the, the old huge oak timbers and like this great uh, uh, fireplace, which has uh, uh, emblems of the Bulkley family on it. And um, and uh, on the outside, it's sort of an H uh, plan house where the, this main hall is at the center of it there. And then you've got um, sections uh, with two story sections with rooms on either side. This uh, isn't usually open to the public. You can see it from the outside, but it's not open to the, for the inside. But Cadu do, uh, when they have uh, the uh, Cadu open doors days, uh, usually in September, I believe it is, uh, that they'll usually have this open for, to where you can visit. So again, if you're interested in old houses and you haven't seen this, it's well worth keeping an eye out for the open doors in, in September to, to have a visit, because it's, you can really get a feel of what these old hall houses looked like in the 15th century. And most of these, all the properties I've been talking about so far have been religious, grand houses or whatever, but most of the houses on Angusie, of course, are not grand houses. They're average little cottages, modern houses and all that. And there's one that's always intrigued me. And this is a, 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 a house called Unis in Coors Bredalia, um, between uh, Pentrite, near Talurn, between Pentrite and Talurn. I, I live in Pentrite, so I often go for walks down here in the... Um, in the Coors Bedalia, uh, which is a uh, natural nature reserve, and um, uh, where this house is. Uh, when I first started going there, I discovered it and looked on the map to see what it was called. It was called Unis, which of course means island, and I thought that's an odd name for a house. But then if you look at the actual uh, maps, you can see Unis is indeed a little raised bit of dry <coughs> land in, amongst all the wetlands all around it. So it is indeed an island in the middle of the, uh, the marshes there. Um, as I say, I was always intrigued by this. So I've, I've looked into the history of it um, over the years and um, uh, basically tried, tried to figure out who lived there, what, was, you know, what did they do, who owned it, and all that. Uh, basically, during the, um, the, the land around here, of course, Bedalia, was owned by uh, Evan Rice Tom, or was owned by the, the Plasquin Estate, by Lord Vivian of the Plasquin Estate in, in uh, Pentrite. Uh, then it was leased in the mid 19th century to uh, Evan Rice Dave Thomas. Uh, of, uh, of, of the Bedalio House, uh, Plus Bedalio, which is uh, just over, um, just up off the map there in little ways. The house was probably built in the 1850s, this little, uh, little cottage. Uh, it doesn't appear in any of the tithe maps from the 1850s or in the censuses until 1861. So it first seems to appear in history in 1861. In 1861, the uh, tenant was uh, Thomas Hughes and his wife Jane and his sons uh, William and Owen. They were, of course, as you would expect, in a small cottage in the middle of all these fields. He was an agricultural laborer, and his son Owen was a scholar because he was only eight years old at the time. When we look at the next census in 1871, there isn't a house named on this on the uh, on the census at all, but there is a house ca called California, which is um, uh, occupied by a man called Thomas Hughes, the same name as the man who lived here in 1861, which I thought was curious. There's, a, there's been no house called California in the previous census. I wonder, did he decide he had this house uh, that was called Dennis? Did uh, Thomas Hughes decide that he wanted to call his house California for some reason? Because that's what, how he, what it appears like in the, in the census. Don't know what the history of that is. When we're looking at the 1881 census, California disappears as the name of a house and Unis reappears. So whatever the reasons for changing the name, they didn't last very long. So it went back to being called Unis. It, but Thomas Hughes was still living there, so um, and he lived there until um, uh, at least after 1881. In 1881, uh, he was um, widowed, and he'd been remarried to a much younger uh, woman and had several more children uh, with her. When we look further on in the census then to see what's become of this house, uh, in 1901, there was a shoemaker called William Williams who was living there with his wife Anne and his children Margaret and William. He had previously been living in one, in one of the other nearby houses, I think it was uh, one of the ones down here, but uh, moved to Unless after, um, uh, after 1901. Oddly enough, William was, his son William 
the son William is called uh, listed as a listed as occupation in the census as a copper miner. Um, when you think of copper in Anglesey, you think of Paris Mountain, but Paris Mountain's a long way from Coors Bedelia. I estimated it'd probably be like a four-hour walk. So um, whether he was working out there during the week, came home at the weekends or something like that, and just happened to be home on the day of the census, I don't know. But anyways, he was listed as going quite a long way to work in the, uh, at the copper mines. Move further on in the censuses, there's no sign of this by 1911. Um, maybe the house had been abandoned by then. I do know that uh, the Williamses died in, in 1906 and 1907. Their graves are in the, the church nearby. Um, so that the, uh, uh, we know that they died before the 1911 census. Maybe the house was abandoned after that and wasn't bothered. The census taker didn't bother uh, listing it. So but it sort of gradually has fallen into disrepair. Um, it is kept up somewhat because it's been on the nature reserve. Uh, when I first started going down there, the windows and doors weren't blocked up like that. They were all open, and it was being used for a lot of, uh, of, of wildlife nesting in there, including owls. Barn owls used to nest in there. Uh, I think they still do. There's uh, one of the uh, windows in the back is still open. They've uh, uh, clogged it up now, or uh, sealed it up now, so that people can't go in there. But the owls can still get in, and other um, uh, uh, wildlife. This is uh, owned by Natu Natural Resources Wales, by the way. All the uh, nature reserve here. So, but that gives you an idea of, of um, you know, of what uh, you know some of the more humble uh, abodes were like. Whenever I go down there, I always think about well, what was it like when Thomas Hughes and his children were running around. Did, did they go out catching uh, frogs and things in the ponds like that? Did they have a vegetable plot outside? I do know that behind the house. I like going down there in the autumn because behind the house there's an orchard of very nice plum trees and it's really a treat to go down there and eat some of the plums. I presume they might have been built, planted there by Thomas Hughes, who knows, but I always like to picture what it might have looked like back in its, in its heyday. Now to a somewhat more grander building again, there's the Pritchard Jones Institute in, um, in Newborough. In 1841, a young boy by the name of John Jones is born in a farm near Newborough. And at 14, uh, he was apprenticed to a, a draper in Carnarvon. He later worked in Pufeli and in Bangor. But in 1872, he got the chance of a lifetime. He got a position with uh, the firm Dickens, Smith & Stevens on Regent Street in London as a draper. He eventually, which was one of the, the largest uh, drapery stock shops, uh, fanciest uh, drapery shops in London, he eventually rose through the ranks there and became co-owner of the firm, which name then was changed to Dickens & Jones. Uh, so uh, John Jones became very wealthy, but he always remembered his uh, North Wales um, home uh, and, um, and uh, Newborough. Uh, by that time, he had, taken, he had taken on the name Pritchard Jones, um, and uh, uh, he was uh, uh, basically wanted to do, give something back to his uh, local community. So not only did he fund the Pritchard Jones Hall in Bangor University, which is the, the wonderful uh, the concert hall in the, in the upper college of the, the university, <laughs> but he also then founded this institute in uh, Newborough. He uh, wanted to basically wanted to build a community center to, to help the people in, in there. So this was started in 1902 and opened in 1905, and it provided a free library, uh, meeting rooms, reading rooms, recreation rooms, um, for all the people to, of the, uh, the village to use for free. Um, they also built uh, six cottages, three on either side, and those were used to house uh, uh, needy pensioners from the village. And they were also, as well as being given a home, they were also being given a, a pension to, to help them live. And uh, they're, they're still, those are still uh, leased out to, uh, to pensioners, uh, I believe. <laughs> It was uh, falling into disrepair not too long ago, but it became, uh, but it was selected as one of the three uh, historic properties to feature on the BBC program Restoration back in um, the early 2000s, uh, which was basically a contest with, between uh, a reality the TV type thing where people would, uh, the audience would eventually select which one of the three projects would be the most uh, the, the needy one. They didn't win, unfortunately, Pritchard Jones didn't, but on the back of that program, they were able to raise 650,000 pounds, and they have restored it um, to its uh, former glory. That's so all the wonderful woodwork in the, in the uh, um, library and reading room and all that. So. Now we'll go back to uh, Capel Kildren again. I've talked to you this, uh, a little bit about this before. 
But um, as I said, this was founded in 1750 as the first uh, Baptist meeting place on Anglesey. It was originally, a, a, there was just a small cottage that was a, a built on the place where this now stands, and it was called uh, T. Kildurin. And the Kildurin, the word Kildurin apparently in Welsh is uh, the word for tip. And supposedly there was a kind lady who lived in that little cottage there, T. Kildurin, who would sell eggs to the neighbors. And all the young children would go around to her to collect the eggs when, when she had them. And she would also give each one of the kids a little sweet. And so that was the little sweet, the tip that she was giving to, to the children. So that's where the, uh, the, uh, where the name Kildurin came from. In 1781, the cottage was replaced by a purpose-built chapel, which is named, then renamed Capel Kildurin, or retaining that name. Uh, and uh, that shows you um, uh, uh, what the, the earlier uh, chapel there. Then in 1791, along came Christmas Evans. He was, um, he was a very renowned for his uh, powerful preaching style and his vivid imagination. And he was considered one of the greatest preachers in Wales. He was born on Christmas Day in 1776 near Clandesol in Ceredigion, and he was a son of a shoemaker. Uh, but he, his father died when, uh, when he was fairly young. So he grew up in fairly hard circumstances, and he even lost an eye in a, in a fist fight when he was young. And his pictures always show him with his, uh, uh, with his uh, one eye disabled. But he was converted at a revival meeting when he was young, and then he taught himself to read so that he could read the Bible. And they became a preacher, uh, first around Ceredigion, and then he was sent to North Wales, first down the Clean Peninsula, and then to Anglesey, where he was based here in Capital Kildurn. Um, uh, he also preached around the island and helped found many more Baptist chapels around the island. So the chapel, this shows the original chapel that was built there, but it was uh, modified in the early uh, 1800s um, uh, somewhat. And then they modified it more uh, later on, about 1846 to 49, by raising the roof. Here you can see the two windows and the, the doorways there and those windows there. But what they did is they raised the roof there on this part to accommodate a much uh, larger gallery there for within the church and you can see inside now the, uh, the, the gallery that's there as well as the box pews uh, inside and it closed again as I said before at the end of the 19th century where the congregation moved in closer to uh, to uh, closer to uh, the center of uh, Clan Gibney and then we go into the center of of, of uh, of Clyde Gavin, and there are these interesting buildings around Bulkley Square in the center of, of, of the town. Um, by the 19th century, Clyde Gavin gradually was taken over as the main town, um, uh, whereas uh, Bomeris had previously been the principal town, but Clyde Gavin, being on the main post road, eventually became, uh, and, and then a market town, became one of the more important uh, the, uh, uh, towns um, in, in, in um, Anglesey. In the town center, there was a pub that stood on the corner there um, of the street there that was called um, uh, uh, Penabant uh, from about the 17th century there was a small pub there but that the building that was there was, was, was later renamed the Bull's Head and then in the early 19th century that uh, little pub the old building there was replaced by this grand new building that's still the, uh, the Bull Hotel that's there today which is built in the 17th century vernacular style. And it's very little changed inside, so it's, it gives you, again, a good idea of what buildings from that era look like. It's grade two listed. <laughs> Around that time, there was an old market hall that stood by. And when I was working on this book, I ran across this postcard showing this drawing of what the old market hall in Clan Gubney looked like, which is something I'd never seen before. So here you can see, this is that face of the Bull Hotel, and there's the old market hall that was there in the yard where the markets would be held and, and bell up on top to, to, to um, make pronouncements or whatever. The, um, uh, but, uh, but in uh, 1882, uh, the Bulkleys, again, Bulkleys on this as well as, as most other parts of, of the island, um, they decided, uh, Richard Bulkley at the time, decided that he wanted to knock down the old uh, market hall and build a new municipal building there uh, to replace the market hall which is, is what's there now. So that was opened in uh, 10th of March, 1884, and it was celebrated by a concert with a, a Welsh, uh, by the Welsh Congregationalists and a nice stethod. The new building had a space on the bottom to have an uh, enclosed market, as well as a space outside for the uh, external market, the cattle market and all that. And then up above, there were council, oops, 
council chambers and um, offices and the like, and a balcony on the front where they used to address the crowds after elections and things like that. The hall was badly damaged by fire in, back in 1992, but again, it's since been restored again, so it's back in action and being used. And then this memorial clock there uh, finishes off the triumvirate of, of Victorian uh, um, uh, architecture by, uh, by being, it was built in 1902 in the Gothic style to reflect the two buildings surrounding it. And it's dedicated to the memory of George Pritchard Rayner from Torreya Scotland Hall, who died in the Boer War in uh, 1900. And here's another um, very, very interesting house to visit now. Um, this is uh, Place Penmanath uh, in, in Penmanath. It's now, uh, it's been recently restored and, and, and owned by uh, Richard Cuthbertson. But the earliest record of the owner of Place Penmanath is in 830 AD, a man named Gardy owned land around this area. The house doesn't date back that long, but, but the actual records of, of the um, owners of, of the actual Place Penmanath uh, and the land around it go back quite far. In uh, 1221, Cluellen Apiorth, the Prince of Wales, gave the land around here to his chancellor, Edward Ed 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 uh, Um And there's actually a deed that could be seen in the National Library of the transfer of, uh, of this to, uh, to, uh, from the uh, Prince of Wales. Uh, and in 1401, um, Owen Glendur's cousin, Geron Rebuchen, who's, who's the man who's buried underneath the tomb in, uh, in the uh, St. Gredvile's church in Penmanath. Uh, he uh, lived here in, in Place Penmanath. And of course, uh, Place Penmanath's both uh, famous uh, claim to fame is that um, Owen Tudor was born here. And um, he was a, a, a member of the family. And he went on to fight with Henry V's army and Owen Tudor married Henry V's widow, Catherine of Valois, and they were parents, uh, grandparents of Henry Tudor, who became Henry the Seventh. So basically, the Tudor dynasty of England started in this somewhat, you know, impressive but modest uh, home. The earliest part. This is an, a, a good example of an old uh, 15th century hall house. The oldest part of it is some of the stonework that's just down near the bottom here. Um, you can't really see that clearly in this picture, but it's, it's the earliest stone uh, is um, from the, uh, the early uh, 15th century. And then in 1576, the house was rebuilt to the state that you see now by uh, its, Owen, uh, Rich, or its owner, Richard Owen Tudor. So he built this main block. You've got a passageway that goes through there and a large um, hall here and smaller rooms over the other side, and then uh, other rooms up on, on top, a storied house. The, uh, since then, a kitchen wing has been built on the back here, and another residential wing has been built on the back, but this is the oldest part of the house. And when you go inside, just inside this hall here, it's a magnificent uh, uh, crammed full of uh, old 16th and uh, 17th century furniture, pictures of the Tudors on the wall, and um, even, um, I'm not sure the exact date of that, but there's a probably 16th century flat screen TV sitting <laughs> in, the, uh, in the fireplace there. And uh, the, uh, the coat of arms of, of, the, uh, of the family then are, are shown on the, the wall there. This was, um, the Bulkleys uh, had uh, the purchased this afterwards, so the, the coat of arms of the Bulkleys. And then Richard Cuthbertson's had his own coat of arms after he um, uh, did the uh, ref uh, restoration of it. Again, this is a private home. Uh, it's not open to the public, but it is on rare occasion. It is open, like for this uh, particular event that I went along to for the uh, Dating Welsh Houses group. So we were able to uh, go inside and see, and see it being led around by, by Richard himself. And one other thing, I'd like to go back now to some things that um, of, of interest for Menai heritage. This um, <coughs> building technically isn't actually on Anglesey, but it's attached to Anglesey by these chains, so I guess it could sort of fit it into, into the, the scope of the book. Uh, this is the bridge house on the, on the Gwyneth side of the, um, of, of the bridge. And um, of course, the, the bridge was built in, in 18, uh, opened in 1826. And this is where the bridge, uh, the, the bridge keeper uh, would have lived. And it's also a functional building because the chains that hold up the bridge would go through the uh, building there and then are anchored uh, under, way underground, way back behind there, underneath where the railway uh, tracks are now. But you can see in its original state, this was a home. The, uh, the bridge master actually lived there. 
in the early 1900s, it was occupied by Alfred Thorpe and his family, and you can see his uh, rather entrepreneurial children were outside uh, selling uh, refreshments to the people crossing the bridge at the time. But you can see here that uh, uh, before the restoration in 1939 of the Britannia Bridge, there were four sets of chains that were going compared to just the two sets of chains that go across now, these iron ones replaced by these steel chains. But I'm showing this basically because, again, this is a, a chance where you can go inside some one of these buildings that you uh, see regularly, but um, it would always be interested in seeing uh, what's inside. We, uh, Menai Heritage, occasionally will have an open house where we give you tours around the inside of the bridge house. To get into the bridge house, there's a little door on the side here, just behind one of Telford's uh, gates here, just that way. You can't see if we've got a gate over there behind the panels. So, but when you go inside there, you can uh, basically see, uh, go up to the top there where the chains are, are attached uh, uh, or go through the, the bridge house. And this shows you some examples. Here's the, uh, where the chains come into the bridge house and where uh, the linkages are to, to, for, into the different types of chains that go into the ground. And if you look at that little hole there, you can look up uh, just onto the, uh, onto the bridge there. And then when you go further down, you can see there where the chains are, are running down to, uh, to there, where they go down into the ground and uh, anchor into the, uh, underneath the, um, the railway uh, bridges there. Like I say, if you be interested in, uh, we have another one of these coming up soon, uh, 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 hopefully. So uh, if you're interested in seeing the inside of the bridge house, keep in uh, touch of, with, uh, with um, our events calendar and, um, and uh, uh, and then with this, uh, it's usually a very popular event, and uh, so it uh, books up pretty quickly. So. Okay, well, thank you very much. I'm um, glad you. Uh, I hope you enjoyed uh, this uh, tour of, of these um, of these buildings. There's lots of uh, fascinating, interesting buildings around here. This is just a few of the, the numerous ones that I've visited and, and that I've, I've talked about in the books too. So it's just too much to fit into one hour, really. But um, as, uh, as I say, I've got, I've got copies of the books here if you'd like to take a look at it. The books are for sale here. And also Julie's book about the bridges, are, uh, the, the pier masters are back there. So thank you very much. tells a story, how absolutely amazing. They're all little mini research projects in their, own, in their own right. I'm sure some of you in the audience have facts that you can contribute um, to the story of some of these buildings we've seen this afternoon. Uh, Menai Heritage always welcomes new volunteers. And uh, if you'd like to join a small group looking at some particular aspect of local history, we'd be delighted to welcome you. There is a sheet at the back on the table. If you'd like to either be on our mailing list or offer help, please do put your name there or talk to one of the trustees. There's David Hall here today, I'm here, Warren's here, Bob's here, Sean is here, uh, and I think there's somebody else as well. Yeah, I can't quite. Anyway, um, so, so history is very much part of our remit. And uh, I wanted to draw attention to our evening lectures, which are taking place on a Wednesday. And uh, these are in Welsh, so please come back if you're a, a bilingual speaker. And tonight, David Ellis Williams is talking about his walk along Telford's Holyhead Road, looking at the milestones and the depots and the walls. So that's going to be absolutely fascinating, and that's 7.30 tonight. And I'm sure Bob will extend a welcome and chocolate biscuits and uh, plenty of tea should you make it back or stay on for that. Um, I think I'd like to invite um, anybody to ask Warren any questions sure. or throw in any extra information that you might have on some of these buildings we've looked at before inviting you to join us for a cup of tea and biscuits, which is part of what you've already paid for. So thank you. Warren. Sure. Oh. <coughs> you said Kilgore, well, the tip. Yeah. When I first came to Women in 74, we had a depot in Kilgore. Yeah. And I was told it meant bribe. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Different nuances of the same word. Dawn, dawn is fixed. Yeah. So it's something in the face. Yeah. Well, 
Uh, the, the, the preacher of uh, Kappa Kildur and Howell Meredith uh, told me that story. So, um, <laughs> well, perhaps yeah. she had to incite to a way of offering something. Mm, to maybe, yeah. Different, <laughs> yes, <laughs> different interpretations. Does anybody have any uh, comments or questions for Warren? So, um, which of the other buildings in your book, your 50 buildings, Sorry? Have you any other coastal buildings in your 50 buildings? Um, uh, uh, yeah, various. Uh, yeah, but uh, you know, I've got one of the ones I've, I've tried to put um, uh, buildings in, not only really ancient ones, but also ones that talk about, uh, you know, tell you something about what modern buildings and what's happening on the island now, rather than looking always to the past. So one of the last buildings I've got in there is the new uh, uh, salt, uh, salt coat, the uh, building for Halen Mon. <laughs> where they've uh, built a new factory and offices down there to, to take uh, seawater um, from the uh, uh, from the strait and turn it into their uh, world world renowned now uh, um, sea salt. So, uh, but that's the one that's uh, by the, the sea, and that shows you how buildings shows an example of uh, new architecture, new types of buildings, and and new types of industry on Anglesey. So, yeah. All associated with the sea again. Mm -hmm. Yes. Do you have a favorite building on Um, <laughs> <laughs> I always take questions like that because I never have a favorite. I like all of them, you know. <laughs> Some of them I like more than others, but uh, yeah. Oh, I'd say I, um, I, I really th the uh, uh, Clanbadrick Church. I think is that's one pl place I really do love uh, visiting because it is just such a evocative area and. and and uh, such a, a nice, interesting building, you know, the, the Islamic designs inside and all that kind of stuff. So I, I do enjoy visiting there, but yeah. And in a few months' time, it'll have the spring squirrel, the little blue scylla, coming out in it in the churchyard as well. It is truly delightful. And you're at the end of a geological tour as well, mm -hmm. which takes you down into Kerbats. I mean, you know, everything on Anglesey is linked. It's just wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, could I uh, ask, ask you to join me in thanking Warren very, very much for such a superb talk.